The French Revolution. What do we really need to know? This is a huge event that really changed everything, not only in European history, but in world history. And we need to try to understand some of the major points of it and uh, focus on the big ideas. It's a really complex story, but we're going to try our best to keep it simple. So some things we need to know about the French Revolution is that under France, it was an absolute monarchy. And at the time of the revolution, it was ruled by Louis XVI. The other really important thing we need to understand about France is that France was divided into what were called three estates or three classes. At the top was the first estate, which was made up of the clergy or the church, and they made up about 1% of the population. The second estate was the nobility, people with titles, people with land, and they made up about 2% of the population. So you may be asking yourself, well, where's everybody else? Everybody else is actually in what is called the third estate, which ends up being close to 98% of the population in France. So you can see they are not equally divided at all. At the top of the three estates, you've got uh, the church that has lots of power and lots of money. The second estate, same thing, lots of power and lots of money. And then you have the third estate at the very bottom of society, which is the majority of society, almost every single person. And the third estate has very little power and very little authority. Uh, they also have very little money. So most everybody in France has nothing. Uh, and this system, of course, is extremely unbalanced. And that's one of the major problems in France. Some additional problems in France, that France is broke. France is in debt. They don't have enough money. Uh, Louis has spent and borrowed and spent and borrowed for years, and France is really broke. Uh, and then France is also experiencing, because of its lack of money, a lack of food. And you see mass hunger, famine, and starvation breaking out across the country. Uh, a loaf of bread was equal to one month worth of salary for your average French person. And then as a leader, Fran uh, France had little respect for Louis. Uh, Louis and his wife Marie Antoinette uh, were not well respected, and there's a lot of reasons for that that we don't have time to go into. But just say that uh, the people of France have no respect for their king. Something else that's really going to cause the French Revolution, just like it did the American Revolution, are the ideas of the Enlightenment. So ideas about freedom and liberty, the rights of man, the rights of the government, uh, fair treatment, all these Enlightenment ideas most of them originated in France, so they are definitely well known and definitely part of um, French, uh, the French knowledge base. They, they know about these ideas, and they're also aware of what happened in America. France actually aided America in their revolution against England, so the people of France are well aware that the United States is now its own country, free from the rule of England. So let's talk money for a second. Louis broke, Louis needs money, Louis needs to tax somebody. Okay, so he wants to uh, put taxes on the nobles, but the nobles say, no, we're not going to pay those taxes unless you have it approved by this group called the Estates General. The Estates General is where uh, each of the three estates meets and votes on taxes. This ended happened in about 175 years, so this is a pretty big deal. So how does the Estates General work? Well, each estate has a voice and a vote in the Estates General. So you've got the clergy, the nobility, and then of course you have everybody else in the third estate. Well, here's how it breaks down. The first estate gets one vote, the second estate gets one vote, and the third estate gets one vote. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that's really unfair because the first and second estate are such a small percent of the population, and the third estate is everybody else. How could that possibly be the way that it is? Well, that was the way that it is to keep everybody else out of power. So any time there was a vote on anything, the first and the second estate would vote together, so they would vote no on the taxes, while the third estate would only have one vote. So the first and the second estate always end up as the winner, and the third estate always ends up as the biggest loser. This is completely unfair, and this is really what drives the start of the revolution. The first and the second estate have been standing on top of the third estate, crushing them for years and years and years. But now the third estate has an opportunity to do something about it. Because of the estates general, and because of these enlightenment ideas, they're going to be inspired to do something. So the estates general is going to change radically. Uh, the members of the third estate basically are like, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. Uh, they know about the American colonies getting their freedom. So they ask the king to change the rules. They say, hey, can you please make it a little bit more fair? We're 98% of the population. We only have one vote. Of course, Louis says no. Uh, 
So then the third state says, well, we're just going to create our own government, and we're going to call ourselves the National Assembly. We're going to make our own group, and we're going to just do what we want to do anyway. And of course, to that, Louis says, no, you're not going to do that. So he has to figure out a way to shut them down. So what he does is he locks them out of their meeting hall, which really aggravates them. So they decide, we'll show him. We're going to bust into his little tennis court, and we're going to take this thing called the Tennis Court Oath. And this is where the Third Estate gets together, and they basically create this oath that you can see here in this very famous painting. And they're essentially going to say, we are not going to stop meeting until we have laws for the people of France, laws that are fair, and laws that give us a little bit more freedom, and put bread on our table. Uh, so then things really start to pick up speed. Uh, so there's rumors that the king is going to use the army to shut down the National Assembly. Uh, so the people of Paris, uh, and rumors play a big part of our story, uh, the people of Fer uh, Paris and especially uh, inside the city start to hear all these rumors that the king's sending their army. So they just sort of go, decide to go storm the Bastille. The Bastille is a prison, a former prison in Paris where they store all the guns and gunpowder and ammunition. So it's pretty much become an arsenal. So you have this really amazing scene of all these people uh, attacking the French government at the Bastille, storming into the Bastille, releasing the few prisoners that were left, and taking all the gunpowder for themselves. This is like the big event of the French Revolution, storming into the Bastille. And we also see, for the first time, and you can see it in some of the paintings here, uh, the, the new flag of France, the flag of the Revolution, the tricolore, uh, the red, white, and blue. So what happens after the Bastille? Now we've got... Uh, the National Assembly kind of has a little bit of uh, support behind it. So they write a document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and that's in August of 1789. And in the Declaration of the right of, Rights of Man and Citizen, it basically ends those three estates. Uh, so they say, we want France to be a classless society. Uh, we want power to be in the hands of the people. Uh, we want an end to the absolute monarchy, and we want to abolish all these old rules and privileges. And of course, Louis says, no. Uh, he doesn't sign it. So this doesn't really mean anything yet, uh, but it's the ideas that the French people want. So let's look at the transition of government because the revolution is going to continue. So Louis is now an absolute monarchy, and as the revolution proceeds, he's going to have less and less power. So the next thing that happens is that... Um, we're going to create what's called a constitutional monarchy. And in a constitutional monarchy, Louis is still the king, but he is going to give up some power to the uh, National Assembly, which is represented by the flag there. And other events are going to take place, and all sorts of crazy stuff is going to happen, and eventually the government is going to transition into a limited constitutional monarchy. Where again, Louis is still the king, but he is going to lose power, and more power is going to be put in the hands of the people, represented by our flags here. So the government's transitioning. The people are stripping Louis of his power and putting more power in the hands of the people. So now we enter this radical phase of the revolution where these really hardcore revolutionaries take charge. They want massive change. They want lots of revolution. And they also are going to want to go to war with other nations like Austria and Prussia, which they do. So they want to spread not only the revolution through France, but they also want to spread the revolution to all these other countries that also have monarchies. And war is going to break out, and it's going to be terribly violent. And lots of horrible things are going to happen as now not only France is struggling with a revolution, but now they're actually going to go out and go to war with other countries. And this is just going to make things worse. Uh, eventually, they're going to basically attack the king in his palace. They're going to blame him for all these things. They think he's a traitor, that he's selling secrets to the enemy. Uh, they're going to arrest the king. Uh, they're going to put the little Phrygian cap on them that you see here. And the government transitions one more time. So we're going to go from a limited constitutional monarchy to what's called the National Convention. And the National Convention is a pure republic. So there will not even be a king anymore. All the power will be in the hands of the people. So France is now going to go from a monarchy to a republic. And without a king, uh, we need to to get rid of him. So on January 21st, 1793, Louis XVI will be executed in the guillotine. He was put on trial, found guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Um, the guillotine is going to be the big part of the French Revolution as a way of executing people publicly uh, who are against the revolution. So then we enter a phase called what's known as the Reign of Terror, and this is where the revolution gets even a little crazier. So they're really going out and they're finding anybody uh, that they feel is against the revolution, anybody that says anything or does anything against the revolution, who says anything nice about the king. Those people are going to be targeted as traitors, and they're going to be rounded up, put on trial, 
sometimes in one day, like they'll be arrested, put on trial, and executed all on the same day. And that's known as the Reign of Terror. And there was somewhere between twenty to 40,000 executions in the guillotine. Um, and long story short, uh, all that phase of the revolution finally comes to an end, and the government changes again into what's called the Directory, which is still not a monarchy, but uh, reforms themselves a little bit uh, and, and, and creates a little bit more structure. So where have we gone? So we started out with uh, an absolute monarchy under Louis XVI. And where did we end up? We ended up basically with a democracy in France, a republican government. But to get to democracy in France, um, we have tons of violence. So we have violence within France. We have violence outside of France. We're going to have war with other nations. We're going to have executions in the guillotine. Thousands of French people are going to be put to death. Uh, and a reign of terror, using terror to make people support your ideas. So uh, when it's all said and done, the French Revolution comes to an end with uh, the Directory. But then it goes through another period where it's just not sure what's going to happen. And the government's not still working very well because people are still poor and hungry. There's still fighting going on. And eventually we end up with this guy right here, Napoleon Bonaparte, who seizes control of the government and eventually in 1804 crowns himself emperor. So we're kind of right back to an absolute monarchy. So in France, democracy lasted about nine years and they had a really hard time figuring out how to make this whole thing work. So unlike the American colonies, France really struggled with democracy. France struggled with figuring out how to make a government that worked and that could make everybody feel good and positive and actually put the country on the right track. So uh, the French Revolution, very different from the American Revolution, uh, but still just as important. Mm -hmm.